so much for joining us today. Uh, let's just wait one more minute and see if anyone else um, comes on into the webinar and then we'll go ahead and get started. All right, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone so much today for joining us for the second um, exhibit series talk in our six part series. My name is Autumn Haig. I'm the Assistant Director of the Department of Rare Books, Special Collections and Preservation here at the University of Rochester. Um, and with me today is special guest Marjorie Searle. Um, and we're gonna be in conversation about women giving back three generations of Rochester giving in the Sibley family. So I'm gonna do a really brief introduction to our department and to this series. And then Marjorie's gonna take over um, and give us some information about different women in the Sibley family and their um, legacy of philanthropy. So this talk today is the second in a six part series um, of short half hour talks um, on our exhibit, We Want More and We Will Have It, Women Running Rochester. Um, this exhibit was due to go up live in person last March. Um, and right after it was installed and put up, um, COVID hit and the University of Rochester shut down. And so we had to rethink the exhibit. And so my colleague, Jessica Locker Feldman, um, was instrumental in getting the exhibit um, shifted from a physical um, in-person exhibit to an online exhibit. And now out of that, we have a series of six talks that are meant to be a deeper dive into um, various aspects of this um, exhibit. So a little bit about the Department of Rare Books, Special Collections and Preservation. Um, I'm sure most of you know uh, this, so I'll keep it brief. Um, we collect a variety of material in a number of subject areas, including books, manuscript collections, um, we hold the university archives, um, we undertake digital projects um, and exhibits and instruction. And the We Want More and We Will Have It exhibit covered a number of different areas of um, sort of women's life in Rochester. Um, the exhibit was um, thematic, so there was one case for each of these topics listed on your screen. Um, and the online exhibit um, is featured the same way, there's one topic per page. And so I just wanna let you know that um, throughout the talk today, um, one of my colleagues behind the scenes is going to be dropping some links into the chat for you. So we're gonna be putting in a link to the online exhibit. We want more and we will have it. There will be a link to a blog post about last month's talk, which was a general introduction to the exhibit. There's also um, going to be a link to the recording of the first talk. Um, it's up on YouTube now. And so um, you can watch it if you missed it. And then last, there's going to be a link to register for future talks. So these talks are being held on the second um, Tuesday of every month um, through June. Um, and so if you enjoyed this talk and you would like to register for future talks, um, the link will be there in the chat. Um, so you can see here on the right hand side, the variety of topics that we covered um, in the exhibit, everything from the 19th Amendment um, and sort of the start of women as voters through the University of Rochester, the arts, um, education, women at work and politics. And um, the Sibley women fit into this exhibit in the philanthropy and religion um, case. And so we're gonna be do, doing a deeper dive into them um, and their story today. 
And so now I'd like to introduce um, Marjorie Searle, who is our special guest today. Um, she was a curator at the Memorial Art Gallery for 25 years and retired as chief curator. She became interested in the Sibley and Watson families when giving a talk on them um, at a historical society 20 years ago. She discovered the riches of um, our Sibley family collections in special collections. And with colleagues at the University of Rochester and with Lou Harper, um, who was due to join us today um, and was um, unable to, she launched a website where she and Lou can continue to store their research. Um, ongoing research, dedicating time to local organizations and hours with family have made her retirement years especially meaningful. And I'm really thrilled um, to be able to be in conversation with her today. Thank you, Marjorie. Okay, you ready? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Autumn, very much. It's lovely to be back in special collections, even if only by Zoom. And I look forward to being back in person in the not too distant future. I'm sorry that Lou Harper, my research partner, isn't able to join us today, or Jessica Locker Feldman, who has worked so hard on this wonderful exhibit. But thank you all for joining me on yet again another historic day. Our time just seems to be filled in the past several months with history. Um, today, we'll be taking a brief look at three Rochester women from one noteworthy family, Elizabeth Sibley, her daughter, Emily Sibley Watson, and Elizabeth's granddaughter by marriage, Georgiana Sibley. For nearly 150 years, continuous years, the names of these women have been synonymous with philanthropy, and not only philanthropy with a big P, the kind connected with publicly acclaimed projects, but philanthropy with a small P, the kind that finds its starting point in the heart and where the giver is not, only known, not always known. The intent, whether large P or small P, is to improve the life of the community or the individual, and that these women did. Um, I kept this slide on because I want you to notice it so that when we get to the end and we'll be talking about Georgiana Sibley, you will have this image in your mind because fight, which is depicted in the organization depicted in this photograph, was very important to her. So I think we can have the next slide. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Perhaps my favorite Sibley of all, and you do grow attached to these people when you spend this much time with them, is Elizabeth. And you see her, let's see, she's on my left. Is she on everyone else's left? I guess. She's the only person in the picture, so <laughs> I know who she is. Um, coming to Genesee Valley in 1833 and marrying one of the founders of Western Union, Elizabeth's dedication to doing good is expressed often in her writing. We're very lucky that one of her diaries is held in the collections here at the University of Rochester, and you can see it on the right. Um, a diary that she kept in 1850 and 1851. It was given to her by Emmeline Molson, and that's Emmeline's dedication um, inscription in the diary, contained in the diary. A young woman whose own mother had died and for whom Elizabeth had become like a second mother. Emmeline was one of many young men and women who were befriended by Elizabeth and referred to her as Mother Sibley. In this diary, Elizabeth reflected on January 24th, 1851. 18 years this day, I promised to honor and cherish until death my beloved husband. I have endeavored to discharge the duty faithfully, but how often I think when I would do good, evil is present with me. An ungovernable temper perhaps gets the better of me, a disposition of fault finding, many little things to annoy, which of themselves are nothing. In future, I will endeavor to do just as right, near right as in me lies. And this too is what I have ever aimed at. Can I do more? Her desire for self-improvement reappears in a letter to her husband seven years later in 1858, in which she says, I think it best to dwell in the land and do good. Biblical quotation, verily thou shalt be blessed. Whether I have done good or not, I have been blessed. 
Next slide, please. Well, I'm here to tell you that she did very, very good. <laughs> Even though she, she not unlike ourselves, often disclosed that she was never good enough. Her capital P philanthropy consisted of, among other things, the homeopathic hospital and the Episcopal home. Homeopathic hospital is on the left. Um, the one of the wings that you see there is the Sibley wing. Uh, this was on Alexander Street where Genesee Hospital, it ended up becoming Genesee Hospital, which is now no longer standing, unfortunately. But this was the origins of Genesee Hospital. Uh, on the right is a room in the Episcopal home, which she was also very involved with. Um, she would go to the Episcopal, she would take a rotation at the Episcopal home. Um, it meant for two weeks going every day and being with the residents of the home who were typically elderly women and children. The, it's the forerunner of the institution that's on Mount Hope Avenue now. It was on Mount Hope Avenue then, uh, but it was not only giving of money, but it was giving of her time, it was giving of her energy, and it was really giving of, of her soul. It's hard to select only one example of her small p philanthropy, but one thing that surprised me was coming across a letter written to her by a young black medical student named her Hiram Tobias Williams, who had just graduated from the University of Pennsylvania Medical School. He wrote in 1901, this time one year ago, I was a very unhappy young man. I was a depressed and defeated student looking on with tears in my eyes and with a sad heart. This afternoon, I am one of the most delighted fellows that walks the streets of Philadelphia. I tried so hard to present you with such good news last year, but defeat in spite of me stood in my way. That day has gone and with your kindness and prayer, I have come out victorious. I love the study of gynecology and it is this branch of medicine that I would like to make a special study of. Two of my classmates, we know that they were black, left for England to finish. They are poor fellows like myself and are going to work their way across on the cattle boats. Their work will consist of watering and feeding the cattle and doing any, anything that they might be asked. Mrs. Sibley, I believe any young man can get an education if he is willing to endure a little hardship. Using the expression, I certainly had to rough it until I, through Providence, met you. When I look back, I think what would have become of me if such had not occurred from your faithful student Hiram, June 11th, 1901. We know that she followed this letter up by funding the trip for his black classmates to travel to England to continue their education so they wouldn't have to work their way across on cattle boats. The circumstances of their meeting remain a mystery. His devotion to her, however, does not, thanks to this letter. Next slide, please. Adam. Elizabeth Sibley's legacy of caring for the welfare of others became a family tradition. You can see that it extended to even the youngest ones, encouraging them to contribute to the hospital that she helped to build by donating to the birthday union on their birthday for the children's ward. Typically, they gave something equal to their age, whether it was a small gift of money, say $6, in this case, uh, James Sibley Watson Jr. was six, or six books, or six toys, for example. Here, her young grandson, James Sibley Watson Jr., was six when he made this gift, and he would go on to support this community, our community, as well. Next slide, please. And there's Elizabeth on the right. This is a candid photograph <laughs> taken probably sometime in the 1890s with a Kodak camera uh, on the grounds of um, the Sibley property, which would have been somewhere uh, behind her daughter Elizabeth's house on Prince Street and their house at um, on East Avenue. Um, Elizabeth was a solid woman. I think we, it's fair to say that. Um, her legacy of care, um, I'm sorry, Elizabeth's church, St. Andrew's in the South Wedge was her spiritual home as well as that of her daughter, Emily. Emily commissioned a mural, which you can see on the left, um, on the death of her mother, upon the death of her mother, which is still in the church, based on the story of the gifts of the Magi. Their pastor and friend, Reverend Algernon Crapsey, whose papers are also in special collections at the U of R, commented that it was entirely appropriate that the subject of the gifts of the Magi be dedicated to Elizabeth. 
as her generosity knew no bounds. In her obituary in the newspaper, he wrote, she gave freely without regard to denominational or race lines to every good work, but her public benefactions were the least of all her good deeds. What she did personally and privately will never be known. She herself did not know, for as soon as she did a thing, she forgot it. Mrs. Sibley never caused those who served her to feel that they were her inferiors. On the contrary, she had the rare tact make them think that she was the one who was the lower player and that they by their service were conferring a benefit on her. Next slide, please. These lessons were not lost on her daughter, Emily Sibley Watson. Although her big P philanthropy philanthropy would take her in some different directions. Thanks to a good education and the opportunity to travel abroad beginning as a young girl, she developed an interest in the fine arts early on, which was she was able to develop in Rochester by promoting local artists and developing her own fine collection. She was involved in the Rochester Art Exchange, which raised money through exhibitions like that of 1881. You can see the catalog on the right. The exchange provided opportunities for women to sell the art and craft work that they had made with the goal of becoming self-supporting. Next slide, please. The legacy of her interest in the fine arts and her support of the arts community in Rochester is of course the Memorial Art Gallery on the left, which is where I worked and began my interest as Autumn said in the lives of the Sibleys and the Watsons which she donated in memory of her older son, an architect who died of typhoid at the age of 26. Her loyal support of the gallery continued even beyond her death and many of her gifts of Mag's finest artworks remain on view for the public to visit and appreciate, including one of everyone's favorites, Waterloo Bridge by Monet, which she had lived with beginning in 1905, only two years after the artist had painted it. It's a very special painting for us. Next slide, please. Always for Emily, the big P philanthropy and the small P coexisted. Her contributions during World War I remained unknown until Lou and I delved into ledgers which are housed in the George Eastman Museum. These are but a few, this, this page is but a few, but we see that a $25,000 gift to the Red Cross, which I don't know if my cursor works, Does that work? Well, doesn't matter. A $25,000, yeah, right, thank you. Gift to the Red Cross is, is on the list with at the top $310 for equipping a blind soldier whose identity we will probably never know. $10 for Jewish war relief and $5 for wool. She and other Rochester women knitted ferociously to supply items to supplement soldiers' uniforms. Next slide, please. Her friendship with violinist David Hochstein, the son of Jewish immigrants and the nephew of anarchist Emma Goldman, ended tragically with his death in the Argonne during World War I. While his body was never recovered, his life was commemorated with the establishment of what was then called the Hochstein Settlement School of Music, where neighborhood children without means could study an instrument. The school opened in the Hochstein family home on Joseph Avenue. The purchaser of the home? Emily Sibley Watson. You can see young David with his mother, a beautiful photograph. While like her mother, her personal gifts were many, including scholarships for University of Rochester students and cars and radios for friends who were living on meager incomes. A story is told about her in her very, very old age, only a few years before she died, when she would sit in the window of her Prince Street home during World War II and watch young soldiers march from the Rochester Theological Seminary building on Alexander Street, where they were quartered, to the armory on Main Street. As her heart had gone out, gone out to so many before, she wondered what she might do to make the lives of these young men more comfortable. A check was sent to their commanding officer. And after that, when they passed her home, they would dip their flags, salute, and sing the song, we've always got time to say hello, as a thank you to the elderly lady who had gone out of her way, even though she couldn't get out of her house, to wish them well and see to their comfort. 
Next slide, please. Emily's nephew, Harper Sibley, married a woman from New Jersey who would have lasting impact on Rochester and the world. Georgiana Farr Sibley's philanthropy, which was both financial and activist, was dedicated to causes that worked for equality and world peace. Unlike many other women of her social class, she was unafraid to take public positions on burning issues of her time, as well as ours now, positions that no doubt shocked many in her social milieu. She spoke out against laws prohibiting interracial marriage, and she opened her home for meetings between Kodak officers and leaders of the fight movement who were struggling to convince Kodak. Remember the photograph that I asked you to look at at the beginning, and those were people as part of a fight march. Um, and they were struggling to convince Kodak to open up their workforce to Blacks. When she became president of the Rochester Area Council of Churches, Reverend Canon Julian A. Simpkins said that she was the one person who can steer the council through this turbulent period. Simpkins was speaking from experience. When he moved to Rochester to take over the ministry at St. Simon's and St. Cyrene's Church in 1964, Georgiana Sibley invited Simpkins, who was black, to live in the carriage house behind her home on East Avenue. A 2018 task force report produced by the Episcopal Diocese included this. Fight also owed its formation and the success it achieved to the work of people such as Episcopalian Mrs. Georgiana Farr Sibley. One of Mrs. Sibley's greatest contributions to Rochester was her work behind the scenes as a conciliator during the 1964 riots. Not only did she bail people out of jail during the riots, her home served as a gathering place for black and white leaders before the official meetings at the Colgate Rochester Divinity School. During the fight controversy, Mrs. Sibley became the president of the Rochester Area Council of Churches. As her daughter said, the job no one wanted, despite the fact that she was 79 years old. According to her daughter, Jane Auchincloss, she had to be president, no one else could. All the others had constituencies that wouldn't make concessions. She got the president of Kodak and black leaders to sit down and talk. She could get people to talk about why there weren't any blacks in certain jobs, but then she would work to get blacks to realize the importance of education and job training to be prepared for those jobs. She believed it was especially important for blacks to have pride in themselves. Georgiana Sibley got into good trouble, to quote the late John Lewis. On her 80th birthday, 800 people joined together at the Chamber of Commerce to honor her. Her birthday wish, that Rochester might be the first totally integrated city in the country. Well, it's easy to say that with a great fortune, anyone can be remembered as a philanthropist. <laughs> well, yes, anyone can be remembered for building a large building. What is less easy to do, no matter how much money is at one's fingertips, is to respond to a need, whether immense or tiny, and to make sure that need is mitigated, whether with funds or actions. The women we are honoring today did both, thankfully. How were they motivated? For sure, they would all have agreed with Georgiana Sibley, who said, the secret of my life for the past 68 years I have followed God through various faiths throughout the world. Their philanthropy seems to have been inspired by the common precept, treat others as you wish them to treat you. Walk around Rochester. When you go to MAD, when you hear a Hochstein concert, when you see movement, slow that it may seem toward racial equality, you will see the influence of these women. Philanthropy is not always about dropping large sums of money. It is about living the life of women like the Sibleys who wanted more for people and they got it. Thank you. Thank you, Margie, that was great. Um, I just wanna let our viewers know that um, if you have questions um, about any of the Sibley women or anything else in the talk today, please feel free to drop them in the chat. We're not gonna be addressing them during the talk, but we will be um, writing a blog post um, for this talk and putting it up in a few weeks time and we will be answering any questions that come in through the chat in the blog post. So um, please do feel free to use the chat 
um, to, uh, to ask questions. Um, and if you wish as well, you can um, email me um, with questions as well, and we'll make sure we get those answered. So Margie, I know that we're starting to um, get close to, to four o'clock, but I did wanna ask you one question about the Sibley women. Um, it seems like Georgiana was the most sort of um, politically active and what we would think of as politically active today. Um, did the Sibley women, um, were they supporters of the women's rights movement and of, of women voting? Well, that's a very interesting question. Um, of course, Elizabeth, well, she would have been alive. Oh, interestingly, Elizabeth uh, comes from, came from North Adams, Mass, which is where Susan B. Mm -hmm. came from. Um, we don't, uh, we don't have any real documentation of that they had ever met here. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was probably beyond the pale for Elizabeth, although mm -hmm. she did manage her own money. She got investment income from uh, Western Union, and there's very interesting correspondence between her and her husband about how she was going to spend it um, and, you and give it. Um, Emily actually is on record in the Democrat and Chronicle as being on a committee opposed to women getting the vote. Uh, so that horrified me and made me so sad when I ran across that because, of course, I wanted her to be a suffragist. Um, I, I know she, I'm pretty sure she voted, you know, once voting was legal for women. Mm -hmm. And, um, and she, she did have political opinions. But she was very reserved and she was very modest. She did not even go to the Memorial Art Gallery for the opening. I mean, she just was a um, pri very private person. Mm -hmm. And so you do have to always wonder about family dinners with Georgiana. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I just I'll just close with this final. Um, she was a Republican, but she couldn't abide Barry Goldwater, and so she wore a pin that said "Republicans for Johnson." And there's a wonderful letter in the newspaper for a man who said, "Well, if it's good enough for Georgie, Mrs. Harper Sibley to stay a Republican and vote for Johnson, then I can too." So <laughs> tremendously influential. Yeah, the, uh, more, more ties to, to the present day with that pin. I love that. Mm -hmm. I agree. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. oh. Well, yeah. thank you so much for the talk. Um, I feel like I learned a few things about the Sibley women that I didn't know, which was great. And I hope those of you joining us today also, uh, also learned something so thank you so much um, for your time today. Please drop in questions in the chat. Um, please, you know, if you haven't registered for future talks, we would love to have you. Next month's talk is going to be with Melissa Mead, um, University Archivist, talking about the history of women at the University of Rochester. I, this is gonna be a great talk. Um, I'm really, really excited about that. So thank you again for joining us today and uh, we hope to see you again next month. Bye-bye. Okay.